Thank you, Anthony, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure this morning to have the opportunity to share with you my thoughts on the tall building in the context of the economic environment we find ourselves in, and in particular, the way in which the Leadenhall Building in London responds to that environment. Today, I'd like to share with you a little about Oxford Properties, who we are, and our relationship with the tall building, to consider the glo global economic crisis and its impact, to consider the investment criteria and consideration we now have to have for the tall building, and how the Leadenhall Building responds to that, particularly with a focus on the occupier market, competition, finance, partnership, economic sustainability, design and delivery, and to give you some closing remarks and conclusions. This slide is what my, um, what my boss would call a little bit of shameless self-promotion, but I thought I should just orientate a number of you to who Oxford actually are. For those who aren't familiar with Oxford, we're the real estate arm of Olmers, a $60 billion Canadian pension fund. Our portfolio includes many tall buildings, and in particular, we have a large future development pipeline. Our Canadian portfolio includes a significant number of buildings planned, under construction, and completed. And up until five years ago, we were purely a Canadian business. The images you see, see here on the screen will be familiar to many of you in the room. These include Royal Bank Plaza, a tower of 180 metres in Toronto, built in the 1970s. Canada Trust Tower, 200 metres high, built in 1990, again in Toronto. 1250 René Levesque in Montreal, a 226 metre tower, completed in 1992. The latest in the Canadian portfolio, Centennial Place, where there's a tower of 180 metres, completed in 2010. Waterpark Place is a latest building under construction in Toronto, and at 150 metres, I think it may, it may qualify as a tall building. I'm not quite sure what that definition is yet. If we look at 100 Adelaide, this is due to start in um, later this year, and this will stand at over 200 metres high. As I said, we were a Canadian business purely up until five years ago. We now have offices in New York and in London, and in both cities we are pleased to be involved in the development and construction of tall buildings. In New York, our partnership with Related Properties has just commenced construction of the first tall building at Hudson Yards. This is part of a 15 million square foot redevelopment in Manhattan, regeneration in Manhattan, and the South Tower will stand at 270 metres high. It will be the home to SAP, Coach and L'Oreal. If we turn to London, here we are in our third year of partnership with British Land in developing the Leadenhall Building, which is part of our growing $3 billion UK portfolio. It's with the courtesy of our joint venture I have the opportunity to speak to you today. So turning to a sobering note, the global economic crisis and its impact. I'm sure there is no one in the room today who hasn't been touched either personally or professionally by the global economic crisis. This first really became apparent to us all when Lehman's filed for bankruptcy on the 15th of September 2008. This sent shockwaves around the world and was the first of many events which would change the financial world we operate in forever. In the past four years, we have seen banks taken into state ownership, countries' credit ratings downgraded, many to junk bond status, European countries requiring financial bailouts, unprecedented level of quantity of easing in both the US and in Europe. And in the real estate sector, occupiers' plans for relocation and expansion have gone on hold. Developments were mothballed, banks withdrew development funding, and in many markets, property values collapsed. If we look at the movement in prime London city yields, these moved out from 4.5% to 6 quarter in 2008. This effectively reduced property values by over 30%. This required many large investors, developers, and property companies to recapitalise by selling prize assets in order to reduce their effective negative equity. It contributed to the slowdown of the development pipeline, as Peter mentioned, and it actually rendered many tall buildings unviable. So 
So with the economic crisis as a somewhat sobering backdrop, investors and developers have had to approach, have had to approach the market with a renewed caution, awareness and recognise that there are new constraints. We face a very challenging occupier market. We can no longer rely on the banking sector, as Peter mentioned earlier, as our occupier of choice. We must consider the needs of tenants from alternative sectors. Are they attracted to the tall building? Is this something that's alien to them? It is an occupier's market, a market and their demands are very, very strong. They drive hard financial terms, demand security and certainty, and want greater efficiency in the way they utilise their space. And above all, they want time, time to consider their options, time to consider should they move or should they not move. And in recent years, these decisions have taken a long time coming. This has led to much, much greater competitiveness in the marketplace. And as such, the tall buildings and any buildings we develop really have to have their own edge to them. If we turn to financing, this is without doubt one of the most significant challenges, particularly in many markets in Europe. Debt finance is unavailable for speculative developments, and it is even uneconomical where we have prelets. Tall buildings do require significant capital commitments, and with banks no longer a reliable source, only the most well-capitalised investors and developers can truly bring forward tall buildings. This shortage of capital, together with the risk profile of tall buildings, has increased the need and desire for partnerships. Across London and the world, you will continue to see many joint ventures that have been formed to address this point. The point of economic sustainability is really all about securing blue chip uh, long-term tenants with strong covenants, which should help us to protect some of the downside in future cycles. And as you know, the demand for design and delivery is an absolute, excellence in design and delivery is an absolute. So if we consider the combination of all these factors, investing and developing tall buildings in today's economic climate really does leave no room for error. So turning now to the Leadenhall building, I had the pleasure of standing on the 50th floor of the building last week, and it is truly extraordinary and an incredible success for all those involved to date. To support this bold assertion, I'd like to outline how it has successfully responded to many of the tall building challenges I've just outlined. The Leadenhall building, as you see here on this, this slide, sits in the heart of EC3, the insurance capital of the world. The slide shows how 30 of the world's largest insurance businesses are concentrated on a small number of streets, with the Leadenhall building sitting directly opposite Lloyds of London. It really does have the perfect market positioning. The Leadenhall building isn't alone. It faces competition from existing buildings, Heron Tower, Cannon Place, and the Walbrook, and from those planned and under construction, 100 Bishopsgate, Bevis Marks, and 20 Fenchurch Street. But with the polarized nature of the insurance market, the desire to be in the tall building and the need to be close to Lloyds of London. 2012 and the early part of 2013 really has been a story of two buildings. With both 20 Fenchurch Street and the Leadenhall building now over 50% let, with 12 months to go to until completion, they really have had the lion's share of the market. So what of finance? Again, Peter, we have a, seem to have a common theme on some points. Peter touched on the, the inflows of, of capital to London. The Leadenhall building requires approximately £450 million of capital. It also requires balance sheet security to meet the certainty that tenants demand. We're fortunate in that the Leadenhall building is equity funded by two organisations who have combined net assets of approximately £10 billion. And therefore, there is no requirement for the banks to provide third party finance. This gives us the ability to control our own destiny. Turning to partnership, I chose this 
quote, as I believe partnership really is all about people and how they get along. British Land selected Oxford <coughs> in a competitive process as its investment and development partner. And in turn, British Land and Oxford <coughs> excuse me, selected Langer Rourke as the delivery partner. It is these three organisations that share the risk in delivering the Leadenhall building. And with a shared focus, a mutual respect, complete trust and great communication, perhaps the odd heated debate and a few beers along the way, the partnership really has been a success so far. So how does the, how does the Leadenhall building respond in relation to the ideal of economic sustainability? Well, with Aon and now Amlin, which was recently announced <coughs> as our tenants, we have over 50% fit, of the building let to blue chip tenants with average lease terms in excess of 15 years. This really does endorse the building's credentials and its sustainable value. So turning to the design and delivery, the absolute. The building designed by Roger Sturk Harbour and Arup, it's no longer just a vision. You can see it from everywhere in the city. It is rapidly becoming a reality and many of you will have the opportunity over the coming days to appreciate this in much more detail. It is without doubt innovative in its design from its external elegance to the reception, to the north core and to the cutting edge washrooms, all displaying the impressive engineering of the building. It offers large and open plan, open public spaces as amenities to not only the tenants but to the public. This is a true public space in the heart of the city. The varied floor plate sizes, column free spaces offer real flexibility and meet the requirements of the demanding occupier. The delivery, the physical delivery of the building has been as innovative as the design. And as a credit to Langer Rourke, their approach of design, manufacture and install has set new standards for construction in tall buildings, giving program certainty, improving quality and ensuring safety standards. It's difficult for me to do justice to either design or the delivery standing here, and I would encourage you all to attend the, the Oxford and British Land um, facility here to visit the site if you can, and obviously join in any of the other sessions that are being given over the next few days. So to try and provide some conclusions and closing remarks, we, do, we really do face a challenging operating environment. One with a very, very difficult economic landscape and one where occupier profiles and demands are continually changing. To be successful, I believe we all must be thoughtful, not only the developers and investors, but everyone in this room. We need to pick our timing, we need to pick our teams and our partners well, and we really do have to ensure that we have the money and we know our market. I'll leave you with two thoughts which I think are very pertinent. The first, particularly in light of our experience of 2008 and the last four years, we must remember that the market does go down as well as up. And once you start a tall building, you really do have to finish it. There is no value in a half-built building. I'd like to um, leave you now with a short video that hopefully puts the Leadenhall building in the context of the tall buildings in the City of London.
giving you an insight into the Leadenhall building developed for London. Thank you. Thank you.